Want to get some free money? Tune in today. In addition to the free money, we're going to be sharing what I wish I'd have known when I was 14. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Restoring order to your financial chaos. Retirement, investing, taxes. You've got financial questions. He's got financial answers. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Bo, since we're doing something that's completely different, let's go ahead and get that out of the way before we we get into today's show. Because yeah. today's show is kind of an exciting one for me personally. Yeah, so uh, what's going on is we are actually legitimately giving away money. Uh, no catch, no gimmicks. We're going to give away money to you guys uh, as a token of our appreciation and for a new initiative. Uh, a lot of you know that now we are on YouTube. We are now recording these podcasts. Uh, we've been listening to the feedback that you guys have given us. So, Josh, when you're watching this, you'll notice we're doing something different that <laughs> we've never done layout. before. Uh, so go out to YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Show. Check us out. And this is what we want you to do. We want you to, sub- so to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And what we're going to do is on the last podcast before Thanksgiving, so November 17th. That's correct. We're going to put all of our YouTube subscribers' names in a hat. We're going to draw one, and we're going to give you a 1000 bucks. We're going to write you a check, mail it to you, free money, no catch, uh, nothing there. So if you want to, go ahead, go out to YouTube, click subscribe, uh, and that's all you have to do, and we're going to give you a 1000 bucks. It's the big red button. And here's the thing, and a lot of you are probably saying, well, hey, Mick, I'm, I'm part of the, the, the family already. I've already subscribed. Don't worry. If you've already subscribed, you're in the drawing. You've already done the hard work. So just go ahead and tell your friends and family. If anybody you know that, that would love and benefit from this great advice, as well as use $1,000, go out there and check out. It's youtube.com slash money guy show. That's it. Um, other thing, let's get the house cleaning out of the way. And then I want to jump right into this one because it's really personal to me is you guys know we work with clients over majority of the country mm-hmm. now. That's right. Take relationship to the next level. We've been doing this show since 2006. So that the years are racking up well over a decade now. If you love what you hear, you like that our mentality is this abundance mentality where we just give it away. Right. You know, let us know on the contact. We have a contact page both on the Money Guy show as well as Abound Wealth. We're always looking for great clients that we can work with. So, uh, you know, check us out, and we'd love to have you join the family. Here's what I think is so amazing about the folks who listen to this show. We have some maps, both on the AboundWealth.com website as well as the MoneyGuy.com website. And you guys are so creative because a lot of you have written us and said, Hey, I noticed that you don't have a client in this state. Yep. If I were to sign up, is there a good guy discount? Is there a cool guy discount? And I, I just think it's so funny that you guys ask that. And... The answer might be yes. Uh, you never know if you don't ask. <laughs> they don't have to go to retail me not when you're giving out <laughs> things like that. So here's why this is personal. I want to share this because this is important to me. Um, I, I get, you know, since I, I crossed over the 40 mark, which unfortunately has been a few years I'm now. I'm going to say since. That's... I've, I've gotten very sentimental about why things. And here's what's, I've got a, a thing that's exponentially impacted me even more is the fact that just a few weeks ago, my oldest daughter turned 14. And guys, I don't know where it goes. I know that is so cliche-ish to say time just flies, but it sure. literally does. And you have this this cute little girl that you wake up one day and she's now turning into a beautiful woman. I mean, it, it, it's, it's truly, it freaks you out. I mean, because yeah. I have two daughters and I, I've realized, here's the thing I think as a parent is that I've always tried as we're, as I'm doing the the carpool as I'm, you know, just have some spare moments with, with my daughter, I'm always like trying to give her life lessons. Mm-hmm. But as a parent, you wonder, is that stuff connecting? Is, is, is this really, is she benefiting from this like I, I would hope she would? And I, what, here's what I realized. I think my oldest daughter knows, well, she obviously knows we do this podcast. Right. And she knows that this podcast has done some tremendous things um, for my business. And then it, it has kind of a cool factor to it, sure, you know, yeah. cause this is, if you, if you could say I'm doing anything hip, it's not the, the, the sweater vest that I'm wearing today. <laughs> it's probably that we started doing a podcast in 2006. That's hip, so, man. so, so that kind of resonates with my daughter who already blows me out of the water with technology and everything else. So I, what I went to her and I said, look, what I'm thinking about doing is cause I'm so sentimental about you moving away. I know I'm, it's really real, real in the fact that She's going to be gone mm-hmm. in just a few years and going to college and out on her own. And I said, if I did a podcast for you of just things that I wish I knew at 14 years of age, would you listen to it? She's like, yeah. 
And so here's what was really cool, because this has been weighing on me for probably three to four weeks now. We, when we were out in California for Podcast Movement, we had a, a client appreciation dinner, and um, I even shared that with a few of our clients. And guys, I know you're listening, so this is the culmination of that, is is that this, I wanted to get it right. And then I woke up an hour early this morning because I was so excited about yeah. doing this show, but there's also a part of me that's fearful of not doing a great job right. but because when I did Google searches and I tried to go and grab some books that I had because I've read books on financial management with kids mm-hmm. I couldn't find anything that kind of got it all laid out for me the way I wanted it especially in a, in a podcast format sure. where we could do this hopefully in 35 to 50 minutes so we're going to jump in and here's how I've broken this out in the beginning is just some financial fundamentals of how, things you could actually implement. So that way, my, my really nerdy analytical people who just say, Brian, you go too sentimental sometimes, um, give me the facts. We're going to load you up with that stuff in the beginning, still give you some money guy stories and some life lessons that we've learned. And then I'm going to close out at the end with some of, some of those good habits, those traits, and those other things that really create what I consider a fulfilling life and will also give you a leg up if you, if you understand some of these basic habits uh, of success. And here's the cool thing, because I think you were nervous, Bo, when we were doing show prep. You're like, I, I think that the stuff you have, this is much better than just a 14-year-old. This mm-hmm. would have been benefit other people. I mean, yep. th- I saw that in the, the show notes. Yep. Did you, I mean, you're hoping that this goes beyond just 14 year olds, yeah, right? Yeah, this is no matter where you are, whether you're a 14 year old or a 44 year old, there's going to be some timeless nuggets in here. But if you do have uh, young children or you have young grandchildren or uh, you have influence on young people, this is something I think is so interesting. And I, I didn't share this with you before the show, Brian, because I, I didn't want, truth, I didn't want you to cry. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm reading, <laughs> let's drop it on the show and no. see if we can break him like Barbara Walters. <laughs> I'm reading this great, this great Tim Ferriss book right now called Tools of Titans. And I read a statistic in there that I, I had never heard before. And it makes sense to me. It says by the time that your kids leave the house, so by the time they hit 18 and go off to college, you have already exhausted 93% of the face-to-face time interaction you're going to have with your kids oh over the course God. of their life. And, and I just think about it in terms of like the ability to influence and spend time with, it's so important to do that stuff Why now. would you share that stat? It's, that is it's, horrible. It's, that's why this is so important. <laughs> oh that's, that's why this, this is such a weighty topic. I think it's, I, that's why I think it's so important that we're doing this. So my daughter is going to be listening to this show. I mean, God, I, I, I really am hating you right now <laughs> because that 93% of the time, um, here's the thing. I want this to be impactful and, and really hit her in a, in a way. So, and hopefully she'll share this with her friends and, and others. And I, I'm hoping that this kind of gets some legs with, with parents because, um, what I think, and I talk about Providence and other things being brought in my life. I've had some podcast prospects that have come my way who have, extremely successful children. And I, and I, fortunately, just yesterday, I got to have lunch with, with a few of them mm-hmm. and, and they were sharing and I got to totally pepper them with questions. So some of that's going to make it on here. And then sure. you guys, I want to thank you on Twitter. Several of you <laughs> jumped in, gave me some suggestions on Twitter when yep. I put some stuff out there. You listen, I teased this on the previous podcast. So let's kind of jump in. And I started off, I mean, I didn't hold back. I rolled out with the big guns in the beginning because this is, I think if you ask me, what's the biggest thing that drives success is a mindset of deferred gratification. And this thing echoes through other people who are really successful at motivating people. You know, we're in the, in the, in the, the backyard of Dave Ramsey and others. And Dave has a saying where he says, live like no one else. So you can live like no one else Mm -hmm. in the future. And what he's really referring to, and it's something we talk about constantly is this deferred gratification that every dollar you put away today or everything you put off now, whether it's investing, taking your time, because time is a resource too, and investing for the future by studying, um, bettering yourself, that stuff usually pays off exponentially in the future. And I wanted to bring this back so in case there are 14 year olds listening, I play, I love, I grew up playing games okay. and, and it's not, I'm not talking about because board games like Monopoly pl- apply under this concept, sure. but, and this is going to show my age, but there's games that were on social media, like Facebook, like Farmville, Mob Boss and okay. other things, all these. And then, and I had a game back on Intellivision years ago, people <laughs> either had 2600, Atari 2600 or the Intellivision. I had a game called Utopia where all these strategy games are basically built up to where you're supposed to be in charge of 
your direction uh, uh, and, and it really applies nicely to life. And all these games, here's the thing. They create distractions. They're always like mob boss. I, I got really hot and heavy on mob boss. Sure. What they want you to do, the temptation is they want you to go buy the cool guns, the cool cars, all the cool things that if you were a mobster, you'd think would be fun. Right. But if you really want to win the game, the best thing you can do is go acquire as many resources and income producing assets mm-hmm. as possible, whether it's, you know, a, a, a shop that's going to create income for your growing empire. Farmville, you want to plant more crops. Sure. Monopoly, you want to buy as much property as possible. Mm-hmm. All those things are deferred gratification in the fact that you're, you're investing in the future. You don't get an immediate benefit. You're not getting to do the cool stuff in the beginning. But once the assets start growing upon themselves, it does allow you to, to create and go buy all the cool stuff, but you had to kind of defer that sure. for, for many years before you got to jump in and do the fun part that comes with it. So you're saying one of the most important things is getting that baseline established. Because once you have that, then it can kind of build upon itself. What I think is really interesting is this isn't just a financial concept. I mean, how many times do we see young folks who either squandered their freshman year in high school or freshman year in college, and those bad decisions kind of followed them around all the way throughout because they weren't willing to establish the baseline of good grades so that they could, you know, maybe take it easier, have more fun later on. That, that, it ties in because show prep, guys, by the way, is I write up some things, Bo adds a few things, and, but we don't actually talk about, we don't actually go back and read. So when you say things, it really does trigger things of, sure. of what I'm thinking. Um and I was in college, and this ties into what you're saying, and I, and I love that my daughter's going to see this, is that because I think it's easy to look back and say, life look, looks easy now. Mm-hmm. It, it is, because once you start, it, there's this snowball effect in this um, building of you mean, re, critical mass. Sure. I think that's really where, once you reach a certain level, things look easy. Yep. But here, there are decisions. Our life is really a culmination of, of a bunch of different r- splits in the road, forks in the road, and you choose your path. You know, mm-hmm. we even, when we listen to Kevin Hart's autobiography, yeah. he talked about that. And he I think did. that that is a, a key thing. I know in college, I was having a great time in college. And, you know, I did it very responsibly, but also still had a great time sure. going out and doing things. But when I switched to an accounting degree, an accounting major, a lot of my, my friends from college are like, what are you doing? You know, that's, that's harder. You yeah. know, it's, it's, you're not going to be able to go out as much. You're not going to be able to do as much. And, and it's true. I mean, I missed out. I had my college roommates, one of them, married a girl from the French Quarter. I mean, lived oh, in the French yeah. Quarter. She grew up in the French Quarter. So they went to every Mardi Gras. I didn't get to go to any Mardi Gras oh, because man. I was deferring and for the, for this future, yeah. and and I tell that to, because I think that it's it's an important concept that it's not just a money thing. Mm-hmm. It, it could be whether you choose a major in in college. It could be whether you're studying extra or taking a harder course load Opting for in high school AP, AP yep. courses or honors courses. All that stuff really does lead you towards your your journey on success, and and I think that that's deferred gratification goes so deep. It's not just a financial concept. It goes all parts of your life, so it's important to, to to do that. So the transition I wanted to have next, and this ties into, um, you know, I've talked about that that economics teacher I had in high school that shared with me that if I just saved a hundred dollars a month, you know, I would be a millionaire by the time I was sixty five, and that right. broke that concept that not coming from money that I can have a million dollars. So I did this, and this is what's cool with knowing that I was going to do the show for three weeks. I pulled my daughter aside and said, "Hey, I'm doing show prep. I want to talk to you." Um, what do you think it would take to be a millionaire? I could see her. I could see her. her you know, her wheels start. And she's good at math. Yeah, I mean, no, she's, she's, she's great at math. My daughter, she is just like me in the fact that I think her brain works in a very mathematical way. She's beautiful. She's brilliant. Um, my problem, and, and I'm glad she gets to hear this, is that I want her to attack life more. I want her. I think you have all these talents. That there's this mentality that you should use talents and try to, you know, see how much you can stretch and accomplish. And and I'm trying. I'm trying to instill that in her sure. as well. But here's getting back on with. I said, what do you think it takes to make a, a million dollars? And I and 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 I could see her brain turning. And I I put it. I brought it down into to even more digestible terms. I said, okay, think about this. You typically, you're not at the age where you're babysitting, mm-hmm. son. I said, you know, so you, we babysit probably two weekends a month. You know, you're making, and I, and I said, so you're pulling in, you know, 60 bucks, 100 bucks, something sure. in there. I said, how much of that would you think you'd be willing to put aside if you could have a million dollars? 
And she gave an answer, and it was, you know, 30, 40 bucks or right. something like that. And I said, okay. I said that, but the actual answer is $52, meaning that if you start at 14 years of age and you saved $52 a month, earning 10%, which historically is pretty reasonable, sure. by the time you're 65, you would have a million dollars. And I could see the light bulb go off in her head where she was like, wow, I could do $52. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of the same thing I had. So, I decided I wanted to do something because I've had other, I wanted to do something different because I've had podcast listeners tell me they're doing this and I wanted to implement and I wanted to share it with you guys so you could hear how this actually manifested also when I was talking to my daughter about it. I said, well, here's the thing, honey, I want to, how about if you knew daddy was, and mommy and daddy were actually going to help you fund that goal? I want to do, I want to create, just like your employer, when you go and start your first job, your employer is going to provide a match. They're going to right. say, hey, if you give 3% or 4% of your wages towards your retirement plan, we're going to give you a 100% match on that money or 50% match because we want to encourage you to do this good habit of saving for the future. Right. But I don't want to wait. Here's the thing, and this is why podcast listeners have shared this with me. I don't want to wait until my daughter's 22 years of age before I have to see, is she going to make the right decision on deferring gratification and saving for a future. It's kind of like I missed the marshmallow test. You know, right, if you right, go right. and Google that, I think around two years of age, I missed that one. So I don't want to Is take really any chances. I, truthfully, I'm doing that off memory. Okay. Might want to, you're the one with the computer. I, well, make my, sure we don't give bad information. Well, I'm just, my daughter would crush those marshmallows, my two year old. <laughs> so, she, so maybe it's not two years old, but maybe it was five years old. But okay. you might want to check that out to clarify. But I just wanted to find out, I said, what if. We're going to do just like your employer. What if I gave you 100% matching up to whatever you put in up to $100? What would you be willing to put in? I've already shared with you $52 is the baseline of to make a, a million dollars by the time you're, 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 you're 65. Right. I was so proud of her because she said, I don't want to do $50. That I think I could do thirty-five dollars a month, so then I could do. We would be putting seventy dollars so, a month. Hey, let me tell you what I get excited about. She could have done the easy math and said, "Okay, well, half of fifty is twenty-five. I'll do twenty-five, and that'll get me." But she actually went even a little above and beyond. Well, and, and here's the thing, because you guys are probably you're listening, and you're thinking, "Well, I need to give some guidance to my kids and tell them as a percentage or how to think about saving in general." And you know, from listening to the podcast, our number is fifteen to twenty percent of your income and your wages. Now, the good news about a fourteen-year-old is they don't have a lot of things pulling at the, the purse strings. <laughs> Not so that, a ton that of 15 expenses. to 20 percent. So I was excited to see that she was, because she probably does pull in 60 to $100 uh, because, and you'll hear in a minute, I get a discounted rate. I get what's called a food and shelter discount. So she, she makes a little bit less when she's babysitting for, for, for me and my wife. But then she does babysit some of the neighbor kids and she gets full market rate, full, bo- full bear on that. So I, I was trying to explain to her that, I think it's awesome that she's willing to save somewhere between if she's making sixty dollars a month, that that's well over fifty percent. Mm-hmm. If she's making a hundred, then you know that she's thinking about thirty five percent of her money for that's the future. Great. That's very healthy, and that and that's a great thing. Here's the other cool thing I liked. I did the math for. Her. I said, you know what? That's great that you're going. You're not doing the minimum, which was the fifty two dollars. Mm-hmm. You're going seventy. That turns into one million three hundred and forty-one thousand dollars. Wow! She added another three hundred thousand dollars just by changing that that thing of behavior. And here's the other thing I tried to to, to share with with her is that that is the equivalent of six hours. If you think about what you have to do to to put that money in, that thirty-five dollars is six hours of watching her sister, or it's three hours of watching a neighbor, you know, neighbor's kids or something Sounds like, like you pay that. Half as much. Well, was, like I said, there's a food and shelter discount. Do those do those bleed over to any like? Do you pay thing? for any food and shelter? I mean, I'm, buyer I, I'm willing to let you buy into this <laughs> arbitrage situation if you're willing to subsidize the other side of raising children. But so that that's the thing is that one million three hundred forty one thousand dollars. That's talking. I mean, and that's easy. A fourteen. And by the way, this was a cool thing on Twitter where you guys were sharing this. It was like I wish somebody had told me at twenty five dollars a month it would have changed. You know, my life. Yeah. That, that is so, so true. And I really appreciate you guys jumping in there and being part of this. 
It's um and Bo, you would I know you had talked about I, I have the the food and shelter discount. Sure. You were mentioning that you know you're wondering if yeah, there's anything else. Yeah, I was trying else. to I was trying to figure out if I could get on that train, but I didn't realize I'd have to start feeding her and putting a roof over her head. But I do think it's important to note you don't have to have uh, uh if you're someone who's not 14 and you're listening to the show, you don't have to have a mom or dad that does this because odds are if you have a retirement plan at work, you have this very same option. If you're not taking full advantage of the employer match, you're literally walking away from free money. Just like if you don't subscribe on YouTube, you're literally walking away from the potential to earn $1,000 for free. Just thought I'd drop that in there. I like how you work that in. So where do you start? Because I've given you, here's the thing. I want this to be a motivator. I want the fact of, because when I go out there and do internet research for the podcast, I'm surprised when I give the stat or when I did a Google search on 80% of millionaires are first generation. Maybe they didn't inherit it. It wasn't passed no, down. It means it created it first. And you go out there and do a Google search on that stat. Type, mil, you know, millionaire next door, eighty percent first generation. Um, you, you'll be, you'll see that comes Reddit and all kind of other things where people are like it's crazy. You know, the system's fixed because I grew up under that mentality. And there's so many people that are fighting it. I, I guess they don't own a financial calculator because you can quickly see that this stuff is legit if you just start early enough. So we want to. I want to get you motivated first, and now let's talk about how you actually. What's the steps forward that's going to help you get to work and conquer this financial world by replicating this these behaviors that are good stewardship as well as just good financial management. And again, I think the things we're about to go through, I think they're so important because Brian, when you graduated high school, yeah. right, long, long time ago, <laughs> when you graduated high school, how many like personal finance classes did you have where they taught you how to balance a checkbook and they taught you how to do a budget and they taught you how to balance debits and credits. It didn't exist. Didn't exist. It, it didn't. And I came through uh, much later, or much later than you did. And it still wasn't there. So our kids and young people aren't being equipped with this and they get thrown out into the world. So we as parents kind of have to bear that responsibility for teaching them those things. Hence the podcast for 14 year olds. So let's talk about this. The first thing, this is step one, and this is what I'm working on right now. I've got emails out there. We are in full implementation mode here at the Preston household. Checking account. Okay. Here's what I like about setting up a checking, because here's the other cool thing about this exercise of educating my four. This has been great, truly, Bo. I yeah. hope you, and my daughter, hopefully she's listening and going, yeah, we are making steps forward. My daughter has been essentially just compiling all of her money she's been earning and just keeping in a place that I told her was not very secure, not okay. very smart to keep it the way she's doing it. So she went and compiled it all. And I don't know how she's done it. She's a squirrel. So there's, so there's she has close to a thousand dollars saved up already at 14. Yeah. I mean, That's she amazing. only started babysitting recently. So yeah. this is basically her just That's being like a birthday squirrel money stuff, of birthday right? money. So yeah. I was really impressed because I'm not so sure I had a thousand dollars at 14. I don't know that and, and that's not coming. Oh, it's not coming from mommy and daddy giving big <laughs> birthday presents, see, big gifts, unless she's going and pawning them off. I mean, we're not giving her cash, so somehow she is squirreling this money away. So I was already impressed. So I, I said, well, you know, now that we know how much money you have, because she compiled it all, and I loved how she organized it, separated, put sticky, you know, essentially slivers of paper and sticky notes between them, so she could, you know, have it all right, laid right, out. Right. Really, really. I mean, that's I was like, she's wired like me. I love it. So. We're going to do the checking account, so we're opening up an account, and this is going to serve several purposes. I like with the checking account, we're going to be able to set up a debit card. Yep. What I like about a debit card is a debit card is going to allow her to move into the modern way transactions are done, meaning that when she goes to Target or she goes to Walmart or anywhere else that she's going to a retailer and spending money, instead of her, you know, pulling out, you know, random money and change. She's going to be able to swipe like sure. everybody else primarily does. It's also the second thing I like about it is that it's going to, well, it's going to allow her to have know what the inflows are. It's going to allow, because think about the inflows now is so much easier because she gets a check for babysitting. Mm -hmm. She can direct deposit it right with her mobile application. Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot easier for, for everybody to monitor things electronically and she can start tracking that inflow as well as the expenses and get the feel for that. So she can start controlling the consumption mm -hmm. because I think that that's the biggest thing I like is when you start getting a checking account, you can, it's, it's not so physical with the dollar bills, which I love. That's the, the, Dollar actually having dollar bills serves two purposes. It, it, there's some benefits, and the fact that if you had a stack of dollar bills and you see them disappear, it's it tells emotional. you to put the yeah. brakes on. You you know that, but there's also a negative to to cash. Sometimes I know when I have cash in my pocket, 
I'm much more likely to stop at Sonic or yeah, Starbucks yeah. or something like that because it just feels like it needs to be spent right. easier. So it's going to allow her to start trying out and figure out where her behavioral limitations are by having that debit card. It's also great practice to eventually she will have some type of credit card. You know, way too early to have that, but she at least will have the behavior down, the practice swings of knowing how to manage the inflows, the outflows. It's great practice to 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 understanding how to be a responsible credit card user in the future. Now, this may be totally tangential, and I apologize if I'm off, but my daughters are so young, I have no idea. Do 14-year-olds carry purses? Are purses, a th- like, like is it, will her debit card be on her at all times, or is it something she leaves at the house, and then when y'all go somewhere, she remembers to go grab it? I think right now, my daughter doesn't do purses, yet, okay. but she's not, you know, there's, there's, there's different degrees. My daughter is beautiful, but fortunately, she's not digging on dudes yet. So I'm, I'm loving that. And I know at some point they're going to wake up, but, um, right now she doesn't do, but she would probably keep it. And then, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't update her phone case or something. So okay. she always had access to a, Sorry, a debit a card or something. Total logistics question, but I was just curious. No, it's a great, great point because somebody else out there is probably having the same thought. I also like the fact of having a checking account is now going to allow us to go to step two, which is we can link an investment account to this, to, to the, the checking account so we can facilitate doing other things. But before we start talking about investing, let's talk about something that's important because we haven't even talked about the stewardship of giving and other things that come from being, being good with money. We got to talk about budgeting. You know, I, I pick on budgeting a little bit because I've, I've passed it to the point where now where it's called good cash flow management sure. skills. But we're going back for a 14 year old. You need to get good at, at, at budgeting because it's not a mastered skill yet. You have not paid yourself. You don't know how much you need to pay yourself. So if you have to get under control what you're spending your money on right. and what better thing can you do if you're 14 years of age? I got to think. At 14 years of age, when you don't have all these things pulling on, you, pulling on you, like you don't have a mortgage, you don't have a car payment, you don't have any of that stuff, if you can start learning healthy cash flow and spending skills when you're 14, think about what a monster, a beast of building assets and being good with your money if you can go ahead and start getting on a good foundation before things start yanking at your back pocket. I think about Malcolm Gladwell and 10,000 hours, and, mm-hmm. and you think about ten, most folks get out of college at like 21, and that's where their 10,000 hours of budgeting starts, and by the time they're 25, they figured it out. Avery's going to be just well ahead of the curve by age 19. She's going to be an expert in knowing how to manage her cash flow, which is going to be incredible. So here's the, here's something we talk about on the podcast, and I want all the 14-year-olds and young people who are listening. Maybe you're even in college and you just – somebody – you unfortunately didn't grow up in a, a house where somebody was putting this stuff in front of you. you. You are essentially the general for an army of dollar bills. So if you can just get that visual in your head that every dollar, just like my daughter, has that stack of do- of money that she has saved up and she's she's got a rubber band around it and it's all divided, that is your army of dollar bills. And your goal is, is you want that army to be very productive, to go out there and grow, to attack the world so that that $1 turns into $3. So that $3 turns into $7. So that $7 turns into $100. Yep. I mean, you want you want all this stuff growing so that you are understanding that you're a growth mentality versus a consumption mentality. And budgeting is going to be what allows you to kind of keep track. That's your, that's your management. That's what's going to allow you to know what's going on. And then a budgeting, a, when you create and become good at budgeting, you also get that planner's mentality because that's going to be the next thing in your evolution of being good with your money. And that planner's mentality is going to lead to a nurturing nurturing and growing income streams. Because if you're watching how much you're spending and you know that the only thing you can do is either trim expenses or make more money to, to, to uh, take into account for what's going on in your financial life, it is going to create that that idea and that mindset that we need to have a growing mindset. So she might pick up a few more babysitting shifts exactly, and try to get Exactly, because you have goals. And once you have goals, it's amazing when the, the subliminal mind starts getting put into gear, It all the physical world kind of reacts to what yeah. you're already when you set these goals. And that's why I love the planner's mentality. It also helps you become more responsible with life expenses. It also allows you to go ahead. We talk about forced scarcity mm-hmm. all the time, which is another way of really talking about paying yourself first. Go ahead and set up those things that are important important to you that you want to put as a priority. Whether if you're if you're a charitable person, maybe you need to be tithing, maybe you need to be giving. That stuff we're going to transition to that sure. here in a few seconds. That stuff is ingrained in our DNA that we need to be if you start getting good things happening in your life financially. 
it's time to help out and do other things to, to, to help others so you can have that abundant, abundance mentality and be even more successful. So with Avery, the way you guys are setting this up, are you going to have it set up where automatically every month a certain dollar amount flows into the investment account? Or does she have to come to you and say, hey, Dad, I want to move over $35 this nope, month? Nope, we're going to set it up automatically. Love it. That's the part. That's Love why it. that whole conversation about $52 reaches a million, $70 reaches $1.3 and she's and I, I'm gonna hold her to that because I know she'll be able to replenish it through the babysitting. So why not go ahead and set up that thirty-five dollars a month? She'll do the thirty-five that my wife and I will do. Let's go ahead and start that habit of Love truly making it happen. And what I'm hoping is that she'll become addicted to saving. This is why I like introducing savings and matching as fast as possible. Because when she sees that money growing, you know what she's gonna become? She's gonna become addicted to saving money. Now, why don't you, if you go talk type in on Google, you know counseling groups for savings addiction, you don't find anything. Right. There's nobody out there giving you uh, counseling on your savings addiction because these are your empire builders. These are the people that are wired differently. You you are breaking the curse of consumption mm-hmm. if you can get addicted to that's savings. Right. So that's what get, I, I love thinking about that and thinking about her becoming successful with that. So now let's transition. We talked about the checking account. Let's talk about actual Things that you can implement and move forward on the investment side. Okay. And I had, and this is came from my lunch yesterday with, with those podcast listeners. I said, you know, talk to me about investing. What did you tell your kids about investing? And here was their quote. Start young and repeat often. And it's kind of like a shampoo bottle. Yeah, you know, it is it. one of those things where start young and repeat often is, is one of the easiest secrets. Probably you could lay that right behind deferred gratification because that means you have the resources to start letting that money work for you. But And this is a kind of an echo of something I've already shared. When you get into investing, you're trying to figure out how much do I need to do. Think about it in terms of I need to allocate 15 to 20 percent of my income or, or the inflows coming in. I need to lay those out there for the future. That's the deferred part where I'm going to pay myself first and let that money, that army of dollar bills start working for me so I can have that future like no one else. But Brian, you know, we work in the financial industry. I know a lot of times we're opening accounts or doing paperwork. Aren't there like limitations to like kids being able to open accounts under certain ages and that sort of thing? Here's the cool thing. You know, we talk about all the time technology is changing the world. You know, with ETFs, with mutual funds, we're on a race to zero on, on investment expenses. So once again, technology and just the automation of life is making it where now, and I'm getting to this and the fact that you can now invest at a much earlier age. I mean, I'm talking about Roth IRAs, guys, tax-free growth. I didn't even, you know, I, I didn't get into this with my daughter, but I think it is something we'll mention on the show. There's different pots that you can put your money in. You have taxable money, you have tax deferred, which grows without being taxed until you get old enough. It's like 65 or 60 over six, over 59 and a half. And then the government wants their cut at that right, point. Right, they right. let you essentially get a, a deferral or a delay in the taxation until the future. And then you have Roth, which basically says, Hey, we're not going to give you a tax deduction now, but that money's going to be completely tax free. So if that dollar turns into $25, us and the government, we're not going to worry about the $24 of growth that you had. That's yours to keep because you put it in this specialized account. That stuff is powerful. And guess what? Big custodians are letting you do that now. You can have custodial Roth IRAs at like Fidelity, Charles Schwab. Mm-hmm. They're out there and the minimums, I think are like a dollar. I oh, mean, wow. it is the minimums have been taken away. So. Really look at that stuff, and I think that that's an important. Now, just because you can open the account, you've got to figure out, are there investments that will allow me to invest the money? I mean, sure. yeah, I can get it in an account, and it's in a cash equivalent, so it's safe, but I want this money to grow. Right. That's where it gets a little harder. So I've done a little research for you guys to try to figure out, what does somebody do if they only want to be investing you know, fifty dollars a month, right. seventy-five dollars a month. These are lower minimums because a lot of mutual funds, you'll notice they have minimums of a thousand to a twenty-five hundred dollars just to open the account. And then if you want to get on a systematic dollar cost averaging investing every month, it's sometimes that the minimums can be like two hundred dollars. Okay. Well, that's probably going to exclude out a lot of these people and take away the ability of my fourteen-year-olds to be millionaires at sure. sixty-five if they want to start now. But here's what I found out when I started doing research on target retirement dates, because these things are the easiest way to ease into the investment marketplace. So if I'm a 14-year-old, and and here's what's cool, funds like Vanguard and others, these things are going out to like 2065. Wow. So I mean, you can it, it is designed for young people to start investing, but let me give you a basic education on what target retirement funds are. These funds, 
you they do the asset allocation on autopilot. Mm-hmm. You choose a fund by based upon the year that you think that you'll be retiring. So it's easy if you just say, okay, I think I'm going to retire at 65. Go do the math, type in your date of birth, add 65 to it, and that's going to be the target date retirement fund that you probably want to look at. And, and the big ones that you know you hear a lot about, Vanguard has a target retirement fund, Fidelity has their freedom funds, and then Charles Schwab has their their target date retirement funds. These are some of the big brokerage or custodial firms that you can go and look at. And the thing is, is that I said, well, what's the minimum for each one of these big custodians? Right. Just doing some research. And it was very Goldilocks. Esque, you know, when I was looking at these, because I, I, Vanguard was a thousand dollar minimum to buy a target retirement fund. Fidelity was twenty five hundred dollars for a Fidelity Freedom fund. So I was like, man, this is where's my answer? How am I going to get these these fourteen year olds in these target retirement funds? And here's what I found: Charles Schwab. Okay, I don't know when they implemented this, but they're one dollar minimum for oh, wow. target retirement funds. That's for cus- huge for custodial. And IRA accounts, which includes the Roth IRA accounts. That's big news, guys, yeah. because that means that, um, you know, if you have a custodial account, because that's what you'd set up if it was taxable for your young, you know, family member. And then if it's a IRA, the Roth IRA, including the custodial IRA, is going to fall into that. So that's pretty incredible that Schwab has the foresight to really cut the, the minimums out to really encourage the, the, the next generation of yeah. investors that are out there. So, so go out there and give some research on that. And maybe you guys will, will find even more answers. I mean, cause I did some, some Morningstar screens to see if I found more, but I'm sure there's others that you'll have insight. And there's a chance if you work with, like if maybe your parents work with an advisor, mm-hmm. they might have access to lower minimums. Cause sure. I know Fidelity and Schwab and others, when you're on the institutional platform, these minimums kind of go out the window. Right. But for an average person, it's, it's looking like Charles Schwab has some, some, some flexibility built into sure. it. Um, what is it required to set up a Roth IRA? I feel like I need to give you guys this information so you understand it. You do have to have earned income. That could be wages. That could be self-employment income. But if you're doing it, realize that if you go ahead and open up this Roth IRA, you need to let the government know about this income. That means that you probably are going to have to file a tax return for that, that, that child. Right. So just be aware, but I think it's incredible if you can go ahead and, and set up a Roth IRA. And the cool thing about a Roth IRA, as y'all know, is you keep the money in there for five years and then you actually have access. I don't want you to have access to use it, but just in case you got an emergency or a hardship, you could use it, um, pull the principal out penalty and tax free. A lot sure. of people don't realize that. You just have to keep it in that requisite amount of time. So, Bo, anything you want to add on the investment before we kind of talk about some of the generosity stuff? No, I think that's straightforward. I think the biggest thing, rather than trying to get everything exactly right, is just to start. Yeah. Uh, pick one, do it, start it, get your kids involved, get them uh, actively doing something, and that's the best direction you can move Set in. Set it and forget it. Set it and forget it. Um, here's a, And I want to give you a compliment, Bo. This huh. next section I had. Please, I know, I know, you Please don't do. I don't mind at all. Understanding the value of generosity. I struggled with this one, and I don't know what my problem is. Uh, it, maybe it's, it's a material thing, and I've, sure. and I've really struggled, but I've gotten better at it as, I, as I've, I've wisened up with age. Mm-hmm. And I think, and that's why I want to share that, that knowledge is that there is a value to being generous when you are successful and you start having good things happen. Sure. That's why, and I think this can help out our 14 year olds. I would encourage my daughter, you know, that way, for instance, on, on Sunday, get, put money in that. I think it's important because yeah. I didn't have a lot of that. I, you know, I grew up where I was the first one kind of in my family going to church. So sure. I didn't understand the whole giving concept. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't have to just be church. I mean, I'm talking about having this generosity and giving mentality. I mean, with all the weather things that are going on in life right now, mm-hmm. I mean, there are people all over the world that that could use Help and I love. It doesn't have to be just be a financial. It could also be a giving of your time. Yep. But there is something that's in our DNA, and and I, I did some Google research. You know, can't help myself. You get on Google, go crazy, and um and if you go to the website moneyguy.com, we're going to have a link to this so I can get you can if you you're like there's no way that's true. I'm going to give you the link on moneyguy.com so you can go see all the citations because it, it, they, they, I don't have time to do that in the show today. Right. But I'm just going to tell you the net benefit, and then you can go to the website, get the link, and um, go to the article. It actually gives the, the the studies and the other things that support this information. But we truly are hardwired to be generous. And the proof is, here's the four health benefits of generosity, according to a, th- this article I read where it compiled a lot of things. Being generous may lower blood pressure. 
That's a good thing. I mean, we could all we could all do with some lower blood pressure. Being being generous can help reduce stress. I think all of us need some level of stress reduction. Here's a big one. Could help you live longer. Most folks I know would sign up for that. And then boost your mood. And this ties into the old adage that it's better to, to, to give than mm-hmm. to receive. And I think probably most people waiting for the Christmas tree at, at seven, eight years old don't understand that. But as you ha- start to have kids and get older, you get it. And that's why my daughter listening to this, I want you to understand it really is better to, to, to give than to receive. Right. And I know it will take time for that maturity to develop, but it is fun. That's why I think you probably... Um, I know she's listening to this and the fact that I caught the glimmer in her eye when she got, got the concept that if she just contributes more than the minimum, she'd be a millionaire mm-hmm. sooner. I mean, I loved sharing that data and I'm going to love matching her contribution because I see what it is generating in the future. And that's why it's fun, you know, to, to, uh, Boa, you know, I, I recruited you out of college. Yep. It's been fun to, to, to watch you grow. And it doesn't sure. have to be money when I talk about generosity. It's just the desire to be abundant mindset of giving and paying it forward and seeing what great, incredible things can come from that. Yeah, I think, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who to give credit for this quote, but I think one of my favorite quotes is that no one has ever given themselves into poverty. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't give, a, give away yourself into poverty. I, just, I think that's beautiful, uh, and I think that's a great mindset to have in sure. terms of uh, uh, being a resource for others. So those are kind of the actionable things that I wanted to share. Now I want to kind of get into what I consider the... They're not analytical, but they definitely are very valuable traits, habits, and behaviors that are going to make you successful. So for our young listeners, who are, who t- we're just going to jump into this. I think the key to meager financial situations, and it really is the tail that you drag with you for your entire life, so take it serious, is your education. Sure. I mean, Bo, you come from very humble beginnings. Yep. I mean, truly an incredible success story. Sure. You were always a good student. Yeah, I, I recognized very early on that making good grades and, and equipping myself with education was going to be a pretty powerful tool to allow me to, to be lifted out of the circumstances I was in. And I know, uh, and I'm speaking to my daughter on this one, is I know sometimes classes, you can get a teacher that you don't see eye to eye with or, you know, just something you're like, why am I even, why am I in the middle of this? Why, you know, it's just so easy, easy. It'd be easier if I just checked out of this situation right. and just try to get the minimum. That's why I mentioned the tell part. This really is your education, your background is the, 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 what you drag with you through the rest of your life. So I know it's hard, but it also ties into deferred comp, you know, deferred gratification. Suck it up and work and give your best effort so that you can make it through that rough situation. So hopefully down the road, you're going to get paid back in, in, in a multiplier effect, very much exponentially. So think about that with education. Here's the other thing. I think that I know I fell into this trap when I was a young person. I hated reading. I, it, it cracks me up that I say that now because I did grow up, and if you saw my SAT scores on the verbal, I was <laughs> I was not the smart. I was great on math, but I, obviously I barely could sign my name when I left high school. So I didn't read a lot. I was just not. And I think it, you know having a, a you know children with some special learning situations sure. and other things, having an autistic daughter as well as. Um, finding out that our family has dyslexia mm-hmm. and, and some other things, I've realized that some of this is just because of the cards that were dealt, you know, learning to read through memorization and other things. But I, I, it, you learn to cope with those things. And then the, the true student in you wakes up. When you graduate high school or graduate college, you're not done learning. Right. And this is the thing I want all young people to understand is that you need to be curious your entire life. I think the time that you quit being curious and you you try to stop learning is when you're not in the path forward anymore. And um, even though you're about to graduate school, your education truly has only begun. I probably read much more now than I did ever in high school growing up. Now, I won't yeah. say I'll read more now than college because in college... You're kind of forced good, to in college. Goodness yeah. gracious. I mean, they'll tell you, you come in on Tuesday and then you come in by Thursday, they want you to have another four chapters read. That's a lot of reading. And then you multiply that by four or five classes and you're like, how did I do anything yeah. in college? Yeah. I, there must have been some coping mechanisms. Uh, we could probably do a podcast on that if I wasn't so old and so far removed on it. <laughs> but it is one of those things that your education... And your appetite for knowledge should not end just because you graduate from school. So definitely be curious, attack life and try to get and just absorb as much as you want. One of my favorite things when I go on vacation now, and it cracks my my wife up too, is I will always grab a fiction book, which is entertainment, but then I'll usually grab a nonfiction book because I just love 
hearing how other people are interpreting and being successful in this sure. world we live in. So it's always fun. Have that curiosity that's going to make you successful. Um, here's another thing I'd put down. Hard work is an essential component for success. Um, you know, you definitely need to take pride in the work you do. One of the, my favorite memories with my oldest daughter is that back when we lived in Georgia, I, I drove her to school every morning. Right. And me being a complete dork and loving audiobooks, that, and I think she likes us now. And I think she probably didn't like it in the beginning. We listened to two audiobooks while we were driving her to school. And I would pause it after it was about a 10 to 12 minute drive. We'd listen to 10 to 12 minutes each day. We listened to the autobiography on Steve Jobs. Okay. And we listened to um, a Walt Disney autobiography book. And she still can tell you some of the things about that. And I, th- I love the fact that she got to hear those stories. But uh, it ties into the hard work component is that Walt Disney had a mindset where he wanted you to plus everything. Mm-hmm. For him, he wanted you, you know, if we're talking about a, 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 an experience that somebody has at a theme park or even watching some of the movies and cartoons that he started out with, he wanted you to get more out of it than you expected. If you can go in through life and think about your hard work of plussing everything that you touch, you're going to be successful. Yeah. I mean, Bo, you know one of my business partners, I told you the reason I wanted to work with him mm-hmm. was when he was an, a, 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 essentially an intern at the firm I worked at where we met. I gave him a project. It always came back better than yeah. I anticipated. Yep. That is a plussing mm-hmm. if I've ever, that's textbook plussing when something comes back better than you anticipate. And what did that lead to? That led to me wanting to work with him, sure. not only as an, asso- an intern that became an associate, but I wanted him to be in my business partner as we were growing this company as it started out. Yep. And Bill is still incredible at things. Yep. So even though we've, you know, we've gone different ways that for very positive reasons, I still tremendously impressed that he always made things better than I ever anticipated. If you will do that, if people listening to this podcast will always have that plussing it mentality and then also just giving their heart and soul to the work they do and having pride in it, I, I think that you, it just makes life so much easier. Yep, for sure. Um, here's one. I, I wrote this. This is handwritten versus being in my show notes. I uh, typed up a growth versus consumption mindset. This one, because we were having a conversation this morning. I think it's interesting. It goes back to that first generation. 80% of, fir- of millionaires are first generation, meaning they made it. And that, that ties into second generation typically either maintains or they start the consumption mentality. And then by third generation, they're blowing through the resources as much as they can. And I think it goes to... I have this mindset being for what I consider first generation myself and the fact that I had parents that were great savers, but they didn't have a growth mentality. I actually, what I, my favorite activity, and we've shared this, is it's a cool thing when you do your annual net worth statement, when you start to see how much did my net worth go up and then compare that to your income for the year. Sure. And when your income, I mean, when your net worth is going up just as much, as your income, that means your assets are working for you. And, it, and it's kind of cool to watch your assets grow, not because of something I did with my brain, with my hands or my back, but because they are growing all on their own. Yep. I, I know how hard it was to get to that point. I mean, there was a lot of sacrifice in the beginning. So it's fun to watch that growth. I'm going to probably have a hard time, just like a lot of our clients do who are those first generation going out there and now using these assets for consumption. Sure. Yeah. And I think there's nothing wrong when you're in your 60s, 70s, and you, you saved up all this money, you should be consuming these assets. But I do, I want to challenge my young listeners, as well as people who listen to the show who are 20, 30s, and 40s, think about that growth versus consumption, because there's a lot of pressure to be a consumer in our society. Yep. Are you looking at your assets and going, what could be with this army of dollar bills that I'm building. So think about that that men, that mentality of being a growth person versus a consumer mm-hmm. person. I think there there's something there. Here's one, risk favors the young. What do I mean by that is that I like people taking chances. Do something just completely crazy. Start a company, be an entrepreneur, go in a completely different direction that if your passion leads you that way, it's much easier when you don't have kids and a mortgage. So that's why I say risk favors the young. So take those steps because a lot of people, I think, say, I'm going to leave or I'm going to do this, but I need to get a little more settled. I need to get a little more situated in my current situation. Before you know it, 10 years has gone by, 15 years has gone by, or life happens and they have a mortgage, three kids, and they go, well, now I can't do this. You know, and and that's the thing I would tell you as a young person, realize, think about those big stretch goals, have that imagination, those dreams, 
when you know you're a young person because yeah. risk favors the young. Um, a few other ones, Bo. This was a big one that that you talked about. You you put on here the power and relationship relationships of a good network. You you felt like you left something on the table well, when you, you just, left the you, University of Georgia. When we were talking about this conversation, you had said, you know, what if you could go back and tell your 14 year old self something? What would you tell? I'd say I, what I would have done is I would have fostered more relationships better. You know, we yeah. get so caught up in the minutia of being an adolescent or being young and trying to fit into certain groups. I would have been better friends with everyone. I would have stayed in contact with everyone. Because some of the folks who I used to know that were friends 20 years ago are doing some pretty exciting and incredible things. I wish I would have maintained that network. And even today, I wish I did a better job of really fostering my network. Because ultimately, and I think there's some truth in this, in this life, you know, it's a lot about what you know, but there is kind of a lot in who you know. And how well you know them and, and, and how much uh, you appreciate that person, they appreciate you. So I think relationships are huge. Um, Celebrity-wise, here's, here's what I think is funny. And I, I thought I caught on to this as a kid, and I think it's a fun exercise for since we have young people listening to this show. I remember growing up that, you know, dad, when, you know, somebody would come on, because two celebrities come to mind that my dad brushed up against, you know, in his walk through life. And I think every one of us has a br- – you don't realize – People in your life, some of them, and it might be you for that matter, sure. somebody's going to become somebody. And it's just cool if you look at your life. Growing up, and it, it, my dad went to high school with Newt Gingrich. You know, oh, he was the speaker crazy. of the house, yeah. you know, uh, and he, you know, politician. And then he also, you know, played football with Steve Spurrier. That's so awesome. those were some, some, some brushes with people that when he stumbled across them would remember who he was. Yeah. And that was always kind of a cool thing because I can remember being at a mall once growing up and we stumbled across Newt Gingrich or I can remember Steve Spurrier coming into Atlanta to give a speech somewhere and dad went and picked him up at the airport yeah. or something like that. So we all have brushes. And now I'm getting old enough. I'm an old enough guy that there's people I went to college with. They're like, Attorney General, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or you know, or, or done some incredible things, and that's what I would just tell you. And I think it's a key point to to what you're saying, Bo. And th- and this is a key thing for my life. When I started my company, some of those parents of the kids that I was friends with did come and ask about what I was doing. And I think it, and it's not people I was necessarily they were my best friends. I mean, right. one of my best friends in my life. I was just, I, his daughter lived down the street and I was just always nice to her in school. And yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. that went a long way with how he thought about me. So I think that if you're trying to figure out what does he mean by pay attention to your life, just be nice to everybody yeah, and try yeah. to be really good with the way treat, it's the golden rule, treat people the way you would want to, want to be treated. Cause you just never know who somebody's going to be. Yep. I can remember when I was, um, uh, on the school board, some of my teachers, we're still teachers when I was on the school board, and I could tell that they had this feeling. Hey, it's pretty cool that I got you know the chairman of the school board is um you know somebody who was a student of mine. So it is never that is definitely you never know who you're talking to or who they could become. So you might as well just because it's good, it's just being a good human in the first place. Be good to people, sure, and, and try to include and, and grow that network. And then here's the last one. Great way to close this out because it lets me. Be good to you, Bo, and give oh, you a compliment. I, I love um, it. it, it well, b- before you thank me, wait until oh. you hear this whole thing. Um, this is something I hope my daughter picks up because it is there is there's a problem I feel like in some parts of society, especially with with children who come from more than broke, is that you get this feeling of entitlement. You know oh, that yeah. when good things are happening. You know, that you worry, do the kids appreciate what's going on? Sure, you know, yeah. the fact that I only got to go to Disney once as a kid, but my daughters have gone a bunch of times. Yeah. Do they, do they appreciate it? Is there, is a, a liking what's going on here? The way you can offset that. And this is a powerful thing. Always say thank you. Yeah. Um, Bo, you have that friend, that client who I mentioned, I grew up with his daughter. He, when we were in Georgia, loved to take us to lunch. Yeah. I think part of the reason he loved to take us to lunch and pick up the tab, by the way, was because w- you and I, we have no problem just telling because I really am so thankful. Yeah. Somebody wants to, I can remember, I have so many childhood memories. Well, not childhood. I was an adult, young adult when I was right out of college, broke as a joke. And I'd go out with, you know, one of my friends at the time and his dad, we, he, cause it was Georgia football. We go to an event and then after the football game, you know, his dad would just pick up the whole tab. And I, I can remember being 23 years old and being at a decent restaurant. Well, it doesn't even have to be. It could be Chili's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, 
oh my God, this is going to be fifty dollars. I, I don't have man, fifty dollars is going to. Do you know how much I have to give up? I'm not going to be able to eat lunch for a week <laughs> because this daggum dinner is going to cost me fifty dollars. And then he would pick up the the tab for everybody. Yeah, and I'd be like. Oh my God, this is a godsend. This is, this is just such a big, and I would gush on him. I would tell him, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have made my night that you picked up the tab yep. for us. Bo, you do that. When we go out to lunch with people, if you ever get a free meal, if you get, heck, in your career, you've completely conned me in your entire career here. <laughs> you've made me feel so good about doing things as you've excelled and, and gone, and you're, you're good at what you do sure, too. Sure, but sure. I, I want you to tell that that mentality of uh, uh, being thankful and always appreciating somebody doing something for you. If you just will make sure you say thank you and then let people know how appreciative it is, people want to repeat. Yeah. I mean, half the, remember we said that it's much better to give than to receive. So that when we've told you it increases, it can boost your health wise, it boosts your mood. You know what is an exponential factor on that? Is that the person receiving it just is completely awestruck yeah. by your generosity. Yeah. I mean, when I can, some of the things that have shaped me is when you go work at a soup kitchen growing up. And, and I remember going and working and, and you're giving out stuff and the people who would be so thankful, you, you, you just warmed your soul. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. just felt yourself getting better. And then the people that came through and they just seemed like the world was on their shoulders and they hated, even though you're trying to serve and they, it did, it had the exact, it kind of extinguished the flame sure. a little yeah. bit. So, if you can be one of those people that's, that says, I am always going to be thankful and I'm going to make sure that I tell people thank you for what they do, sure. you're going to notice this beautiful side effect is more stuff is going to happen yeah. for you. So that's probably a great way to, to close this thing out is to say, be thankful for what you have. I will tell you kind of on that same vein, this is a great way to close it out. We are so thankful for you guys. If you have any clue, we just got back from podcast movement and I had no idea how cool this journey we are. We, we, we're, we're doing good things, yeah. Bo. I mean, yeah. and, and we've been doing, doing this through 2006 and I am so thankful for all of our listeners who, who've been with us for over a decade yeah. now. You, you stay true to us. You listen to us. You give us, you know, you, you follow us on Twitter. You give us comments. You give suggestions to the show. It, it, it has blown my mind. It has allowed us to do so much in our personal lives. And we've tried to give back business-wise by growing the show. Now we're doing it through the YouTube channel. Go subscribe. Thousand bucks might be in your hands because yep. of you do it. It's all of this mentality of giving back. And we couldn't have done it without you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you for just listening to the podcast, tuning into the podcast, and being part of the Money Guy family um, and, and maybe you've listened long enough that you're like, I am part of this family, but I also would love to have a financial planner that could help me take to the relationship to the next level. Reach out to us. Go to the contact section on moneyguy.com, abound.com, aboundwealth.com, because you're going to notice it's not just me and Bo. Mm -hmm. We have a whole team of people who have this abundance mindset that yep. believe we really can do some incredible things just by planning and thinking about money in, in a very positive and creative way. Yep. Anything I should throw out there, Bo, or to get all excited and and do it all right? No, there at I the think end. it's great. We are just so thankful, so appreciative, and we're just uh, feel so blessed we get to do this. Guys, we have big things in plans. Besides the thousand dollars, we got some silly, goofy things that are going to make you want to go tune in on YouTube anyway. I'm talking about. Don't be surprised if John. That's enough. Oh, you that's don't... enough. Okay, don't give any. Don't get. That's enough. Go to YouTube. It's it's YouTube.com slash Money Guy Show. Subscribe. We got some cool visual things that will be coming down the road. And then, of course, you can always go get those links where I was talking about the health and other things, moneyguy.com. We'll be back in two weeks for the podcast, but make sure you go into the website and checking out the highlights as well as just the great blog posts that we're putting out now every week. We'll talk to you soon. I'm your host, Brian Preston.